first order of business is Conservation Commission interview with Warren Dorsey. That's here. We'll move to the EDC interview for Michael Green. Michael Green here. Okay. I'll do this quickly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then the Planning Commission interview with Benjamin Pauly. Hey, hey, hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you tell us about yourself and why you're interested in this sure. position? Yeah, I uh, went to Woodstock about 13 years ago, um, came to the Midwest and uh, followed my parents out here, um, fell in love with Woodstock, um, decided to transplant. It was a good point in my life to kind of make the move um, and started um, working at the Woodstock Inn uh, when I first started. Uh, and just love being involved in the community, joined the Village Development Review Board for several years. Um, and then kind of felt it was a natural time to leave that board. Um, just have been in Woodstock the whole time. Uh, but my family's growing and my partner and I are um, uh, run a business together. I still work for Woodstock in, but I just become increasingly, increasingly more uh, interested in where Woodstock is headed. and. Um, see myself being here a long time that I wanted to get back involved and uh, uh, talk with Stephen Bauer quite often and he does a good job recruiting for the boards and uh, determine that concept, uh, the planning kind of where I would like to be as far as you know kind of really looking at what the zoning regulations are and kind of shaping that future. Um, any questions? I have no him first. Yeah. Any questions? Um, no you, questions. Have you been to any meetings? I was to two meetings. Okay. I had two meetings this month, so I went to. And you, and you can make the meetings with no problem. Yep. Okay. I right. well, thank you. And um, so there's, no, there's one opening right now on the planning commission. Okay. Um, Benjamin was wow. voted and approved by the trustees at the last meeting as well. A so vote by the select board would put him on the planning commission. I move we appoint Benjamin Pauly to the planning commission. There a second? Second. Mary second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aye. Aye. I'm like 99% positive that you already interviewed Michael Green at a, a meeting like at least a month ago. Um, so I would check in minutes. All right, we check that. Yeah. I know he was waiting on a decision of the board. We did interview him. I believe it was for a different position. I, I believe he's been interviewed for the for this position, but I could be wrong. Yeah, or at least that's it was a different opinion. vacancy. Yeah, I think. That's my okay, Lauren is here. You want to come on up, Lauren? Let's talk a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in this position. Yeah. Yeah, for about a year, and I absolutely love it. Um, I spent my life in the outdoors and preserving the outdoors. I was the president of the Dartmouth Outing Club when I was at Dartmouth, and before that, I was the cabins manager. And my role was to preserve the historic nature of the cabins. I did a lot of construction there, and we were always thinking about and working with. National Parks and the Appalachian Trail, Appalachian Trail conservators to think about how we could make it as accessible to people as possible while still preserving the natural environment around it. Anyway, it's something that I've always been interested in. And so I feel like the Conservation Commission, I want to give back to this community. And I feel like the Conservation Commission is a great place to do it because it's something that I'm passionate about. Are there any questions? Have you been to any meetings? Okay. And is that another one with one opening? Um, it's actually three openings right now uh, for the committee. Okay, I'll make them. I'll entertain a motion. Point Lauren Dorsey to the commission. Do a second. Second. Okay. 
addition and deletion. Yep, deletion. so we have the permit that I believe is in front of uh, the board to add. Um, so it's right there. Should have been a copy on the table. If not, I can run and get them. Second. Michael Green is online now. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Okay. Hey, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we got yes, we'll, we'll, do my, we'll do the interview first, John. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I no, that's gonna be an Sorry, interview. Sorry, all I'm uh I'm in France, so it's quite late at night here. So I'm I'm apologies uh for uh the bad Wi Fi as well. Okay, well before you lose it, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? and why you're interested in the position? Uh, yeah, so I've uh, lived in Woodstock now for about four years. Uh, my wife and I were uh, originally interested in the small business community here in town and how we could contribute. Uh, as many folks know, we rented a space out to Abracadabra uh, and now we're uh, opening and using our space as a community pop-up. Uh, space for local businesses, entrepreneurs, and artists. Uh, so we, I think that the EDC is a great way to be involved in the community, find way to be supportive of the local small business community, uh, and also find ways that we can help create meaningful employment uh, and meaningful opportunities to build community in Woodstock. I've attended a lot of the EDC meetings over the last few years in different capacities as an applicant for the grant, uh, as well as just a concerned individual following along with the conversations. And I would really welcome the opportunity to be more involved. Okay. Are there any questions? No. And you have attended meetings, you said? Yes, I have. I have a season that they EDC Good. Um, and that's when opening soon. Uh, John, over to you now. Okay. So I would entertain a motion to appoint Michael Green to the EDC. I will make that motion. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Michael, you're in. Thank you. Have a nice evening, y'all. Thank you, too. Thank you. So now we're at additions and deletions. Yep. So there's a permit for the Eastern States Cup um, that Ray has and should have passed out. Um, the EDC uh, wants to be added as well. Um, uh, changing the first September select board meeting till August. Uh, we should vote on that as well. And then finally, um, <clears throat> discussion about uh, Cloud Lane Road closing during foliage season. Okay. That'll be on the other business. Correct? Uh, cloud Lane probably be old business because we okay. discussed it before, yeah. Right. Um, any citizens' comment? Roger? I just want to echo what you all said. Roger, would you mind just coming up? Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so I can hear you. echo what you all said about Mark Hunter. Um, I'm very happy that he's joined the Woodstock Town government. I found him very proactive and friendly and looking to see how he can help so and i know he's probably been putting 90 hour days in the last few weeks yeah. so so thank you and i appreciate that you all also appreciate it great thank, thank you. you and obviously i was wrong about part three so. yeah <laughs> any other comments okay eric you're up Um, so a few things. Uh, first, uh, the aqueduct is still asking uh, Woodstock residents to conserve water as much as they can. Um, although we have uh, one of the breaks uh, fixed, um, the other one is still using a pipe that's smaller than before. Uh, so we're just trying to be cautious uh, until we get the second uh, break really fixed. So just uh, we ask for the residents to continue to conserve water the best they can and appreciates their efforts in doing that. Uh, second, I met with the Finance Advisory Committee last week to start talking about the FY25 budget. You know, FY24 just started two months ago. Um, so we talked on kind of a new approach to how we're going to try to do budgets this year. And we're going to start in September 
Um, so by the first select board meeting in September, we'll have already started the process of the next budget season. Uh, so that should be fun. Um, on 8.29 at 5 p.m., we're gonna organize a um, public forum for the South Woodstock Wastewater Treatment Facility Design Conversation. Um, as the board knows in the past, uh, some residents have talked about um, if anything can be done to make the new plant look a little bit better. Uh, so we had solicited some quotes from Daniels and had some other conversations, uh, but we thought it was best to kind of a public forum so residents could speak for and against uh, that procedure and then talk about the next steps forward. Uh, so that will take place on the 29th at 5 p.m. And so it's like an word off of that as soon as possible. Uh, last two things. Um, FEMA has reached out to us individually finally to get the um, process going from municipality to start requesting funds from uh, reimbursements from FEMA. Um, I had my first contact with the representative today, uh, the first call with them on Friday, um, and then they start their first visits uh, next week. Uh, so that's kind of that's the official process where we can finally now hopefully start getting some reimbursements for the work that we've done over the last month. Um, finally, on uh, this coming Thursday, um, Governor Scott's cabinet is coming to Woodstock. Um, they'll be here for about an hour. Uh, I am arranging a um, meeting with some businesses, individuals, nonprofits who are affected by the flooding. Um, they really want to hear um, what is needed for the recovery, more so than a photo op with some of the damage. Uh, so we're going to have a location, invite about 10 or 15 different groups together uh, with the governor's cabinet and kind of have a conversation for an hour, hour and a half of what happened to Woodstock and what um, individual people, businesses, nonprofits need going forward. Uh, so it's going to happen uh, this Thursday. Wow, that's great. And uh, if one of the select board members wants to attend, um, that would be, I think, a great show of sports. Great. So it's going to be high school? Uh, it's going to be high school, yes. Um, we just had citizen comment. If you have a, uh, um, if you want, yes, if you want to come up and ask a question. That'd be fine. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my question is. So, so you say your name for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Margaret Fraser, Woodstock, Vermont. Um, my question is, if you are a resident of Woodstock, the whole town, but you're and or you're a resident in the village, but you're not a customer, you're a tenant, you're not a customer of the water aqueduct company, you're receiving no information whatsoever. And on the town website, the last posting about it was July 19th. That's almost a month ago. So where is the oversight, you know, from the town or, or the village or both in telling um, the residents here, the Woodstock community, uh, taxpayers, uh, what's going on? Um, so I think you and I had the same conversation last week at the trustees the meeting. Trustees, yes. And I was told, oh, they could look at the listserv, but some people do not look at the listserv. Yeah. And that's not a government function anyway. Yeah, so as you know, the water tech is a private company, so we cannot control their communication strategy or what they want to do. Um, during the disaster, we had updated a website, Facebook page, um, use VT alerts, anytime we had an update when it came to the water. Um, since the last update that you mentioned, there has been no new information from the water company. We're at the same point we've been for the last few weeks where we have water flowing, we have the tanks filling up. Um, we're still asking people to conserve, um, but there has been no new information from the aqueduct. So there's been no real new information for us to post besides the status quo. Um, but as I said last week, I do recognize there's been um, not the most straightforward communication method from the municipality during the crisis. And it's something we're gonna work on and try to improve. Just because actually what you're, what you're saying is that the, that if the government of Woodstock, town council, or the, the select board, nor the trustees have any authority or oversight to say, this is 
water. This does not flower pots or something. This is the most vital thing that we all need to survive. And and um, information that might have gone out about when the testing was finished, it was on listserv. Mm -hmm. So why isn't it on the website uh, for the town? I mean, I can definitely put it on, on the website. Um, July 19th is the last posting. And I was just saying July 19th was that update we really had of something changing. The testing was testing that they did, they did not need to do. They did it to be extra safe and the testing came back the way they thought it would, which was there, there was no issues. So there was no, you know, I think immediate need for us to post that information. Like I said, I, I, we can do better and we will. hope so. Thank you. Could you, could you just come up with the microphone for people on Zoom? DP Alerts sends out updates too. Yes. So you can, and they said that send out the uh, Woodstock water updates. So that's a great way of getting, you know, just sign up for that. You don't have any problems. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to Peggy. So I don't think DP Alerts can get um, updates on COVID 19 on the town website. Uh, financial reports, um, it's very new into the fiscal year, um, so there's not much uh, to point out, but if uh, the board has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions? No, this is no. just okay. preliminary thing. Okay, then we have the artist street fees, <clears throat> yacht club lookalikes. Application. We have two liquor license applications, and I'm just wondering if we've had any inroads with the state at improving the application so we actually see the information we need to. I have not had any more information from the state on updating the system, unfortunately. So I think the, the normal motion you make. Yeah, I would move we um, approve the Ottaquichi Yacht Club and Pizza Chef liquor license applications on the condition that the state is reviewing them. We aren't given sufficient information. Second. Second. There is second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All business, the town hall committee meeting. Alita, are you online? She was right here. When I was coming here, oh, he was. Okay. No. Well, why don't we move on? Yeah, we can table that now. If she comes up, we can. Uh, the Escobog sign at the intersection of Hotland Hill Road and Gavin. So I was talking to Jody. Um, she was trying to log on. I'm not sure if she is a logged on or not. Jody, up. Jody, you're on mute. Can you take yourself off mute? I think it's the first time using Zoom, so we may have. How's that? Better, go, go perfect. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> um, sorry, so you're requesting a sign at the intersection of Harlan Hill and Garvin Hill? Yes, sir. Uh, do you want to give us a little more information on why you're requesting a sign? Okay, well, uh, I've lived up here on Heartland Hill Road about 21 years now. It seems like every season, whenever the Esquibog is uh, open, for, let's say, with the lady slippers and everything else blooming, I get a lot of people driving past, back and forth, back and forth, trying to locate the, um, the bog. And I thought one day, wouldn't it be nice to have a sign down there at that intersection of, uh, you know, at, inter at uh, Heartland Hill Road, indicating that, you know, the... The bog is about 1.1 miles down the road. Um, that was met with a lot of resistance from some of the uh, uh, residents because it would increase the traffic down there. But then in talking to the people who maintain the bog, they informed me that that's what they want. They want more people to be aware of the bog so that they can enjoy it. But anyway, I, I just was submitting a proposal that there be a sign there. And, I don't know who's responsible for it. I thought it might be an interesting little project for some of the garden clubs to design a sign, a little ornate thing. But in the simplest way would to be to be to place a regular street sign underneath the street sign that exists there now. 
for Garvin Hill Road. Just a proposal. I don't know where to go with it from there. Have Mark look at it. Yeah. So we have Mark Hunter to look at it. And yeah. Most only thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll have um, the highway superintendent look at it and get back right. to it. back to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do I see Alita come in? Alita. Alita. Yes. Okay. So just a brief update. How's your knitting? <laughs> um, I just have to say thank you to all of you. Thank you, including you. Uh, these are tough times having another flood and then rain events. Um, I'm gonna give you just a building update. Um, we had a structural engineer on Friday. There's been no movement that we know of um, from <clears throat> the crack monitors. Um, Greg Sellers, who was part of the first um, structural engineer team, his work was completed under a contract the town signed in 2022. Um, I'm curious for the select board, any questions about the reports you have, you've seen? No? No, we, we no. didn't see at the, yeah. Yep, okay. Um, <clears throat> hearing none, please, I would um, hope that but, you will look at but that information that you just told us. is good news, good news, right? Um, so think about the priority areas of work. And I think you have that. Um, this work needs to be done before any work, including interior treatments. If people say, well, let's just paint it. Let's, let's just, you know, make it pretty inside. We can do that. And why can't we do that? Because the exterior of the building, the envelope, water is con constantly coming in. Um, so yes, if you want to kick the can down the road, that's fine. Um, but if you want the continual usage of the town hall for civic engagement, town governance, cultural and artistic and I'm not speaking for Pentacle here. I'm speaking about the building. This building needs some love. Um, the priority areas of work should be done soon to secure the building's future and make improvements that will improve the energy efficiency and accessibility for all. You could decide to delay the work and perhaps address it in a capital budget process. But how long are we collectively comfortable allowing the biggest, largest public space in the village to be completely inaccessible, out of compliance with the ADA amongst other code violations? You have many things to consider. Completely understand that. But I ask you to please consider the importance of this historic building to the community, as well as those who visit Woodstock. It has been a Woodstock tradition to build something new and at the expense of routine maintenance for those other structures. Please don't kick this can down the road. I encourage you to work with uh, the Town Hall Building Community Committee and ensure this iconic gem in the center of the town can continues to serve generations to come. Lena, I just have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of the past, of the prior fundraising activities, how much money is, I know some people um, requested their money back. How much money is there? We have a half million dollars. Okay. And is there a plan of, of your committee to do more fundraising or what? Well, um, one thing dealing with, um, There's no fundraising that we can't do without the town together. And there's no reason to try to 
so you know build support do anything without us together so yeah it, it, it what i would say to the select board is we are all in with pentangle to support raising money um and you can look at the ad access you can look at you know you, you have to decide and god knows you have how many other projects and they're big they're big but pentangle is all in to support and fundraise um to make this building at least accessible um and, and this is yeah so Thank you. Any, Any questions? questions? John Spector. John Spector uh, from Woodstock. Um, I believe that it's my understanding that the committee has only has answered or has developed a plan to answer the question that you asked them, which is how can we, what do we need to do to fix and save this building? Um, so I think that they've followed that lead i would encourage the select board to think about asking them a broader question which is what are the other options besides using continuing to use this building for the, this the community functions are there other options and what would be the pros and the cons i'm not in favor of other options or opposed to them uh, but the committee hasn't looked at them and it's not and they didn't look at them because you asked you gave them a, a specific charge which they've i think done a good job of responding to Thanks. No, John, I think that's a really, you know, I think that's a really good question. And actually someone, I was walking in the green and they were like, why don't you go to the mill? And, you know, other options. Great. Let's look at the cost of moving the town employees. And I'm not wearing the pentangle hat. Um, when you say that, it, as far as I know, Renovating is cheaper than building from scratch. I don't know. I, it could be. Yeah, but I think in your head, you're thinking that we are not looking at alternatives. And I think that's great. But what all the, what are the alternatives? Well, I, that's the question. I, the yeah. select board has discussion with the select board. John, you're thinking, where in the village would we take our... No, I think um, John Spector brought up a, a question that I think the select board can think about yes. and, and dictate later. I don't think we have to go off track from what the lead is presenting, what she has talked about already. Okay. And, Any questions? Uh, for Bill, do you have a comment? Thank you, Bill. Please, Bill, can you come up? Just two person, 18 Pleasant Street. Uh, I'm just confused about where money is, and there's some of the town, there's some of the, the Pentangle uh, Town Building Committee that was not paid back. and. Where is all the money sit that could be used, and where are we doing? What's the plan about building grants to help, you know, re revitalize the building? Aren't there grant opportunities that we could pursue as a town? I mean, as a, as a municipality. Well, and the answer to that is, as a municipality, and we've talked about this, mm -hmm. is that Preservation Trust of Vermont has a lot of money, but it's a big question. If the select board in the town are comfortable with an easement mm -hmm. and the easement on the building and we've talked about this mm -hmm. and eric this may be news to you but it's a 35-year agreement and it's basically ensures the stewardship of the building which doesn't mean that you can't do anything it means if if you want to take the pillars down you have to really have a good reason and generally speaking, accessibility trumps historic preservation. All right, so there are ways to do this. Is what I'm gathering, right? There are a lot of ways to okay. do it. Ways to do this, and the question is: Is it important to the town to do it? And I think a lot of citizens should have say on say on that, right? So, um, if there are ways to do it, and there's grants and money and everything to cover that to do the basic stuff, the basic stuff is what. Um, the the ADA accessibility, as I understand, and the HVAC system, which is about to expire. Actually, I, think, um, Just, I mean, yeah. if we, I think this, we're going to have discussions broader than just the report that we asked for. Yeah. We would have to rewarn. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure. That, I think we. Yeah. Have... Oh, you're right. I was just. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Roger. Can I just um, 
second. Come up and um, I think from a citizen standpoint, we don't have enough information to even know what we think at this point. And maybe you all do, but I don't. So I, 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 I strongly endorse what John said is we need to develop more information about what the, what the options and alternatives are before we make decisions about spending millions and millions of dollars. Okay, oh, thank, thank so you. As a, I've been told that I'm not supposed to talk to people in the audience. So, <laughs> so I would like to say I'm Susie in with, uh, Woodstock, and um, I was on the committee, and I was in charge of researching a lot of the grants, and I want to just set expectations. Because Alita, uh, not Alita, um, Maybe sure. Allison Clarkson said in a, in a meeting we had on this one time, oh, there's plenty of money. We can get all these grants to pay for it our, ourselves. So I spent a lot of year, a lot of months researching those grants. We went to the Vermont Historical. They get you in touch with uh, money that is available through the feds and stuff like that. And um, the money has to be matched through fundraising. I just want to set expectations because when we went through it, John, do you remember the number? It was like, you know, when we were looking at it, 23,000 with lots of fundraising, we, we could have been like, what was it, a quarter of a million dollars that we would they be able to raise with grants? We need to set expectations. Grants are not going to pay for this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alita. Baldwin Road. That and also, um, the EDC is probably old business as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably, that's probably new business. Yeah. yeah. Um, John, do you want to? Uh, um, so uh, the EDC held an emergency meeting on Friday. So, so going back at our last select board meeting, you approved forty-five thousand dollars, which we recommended to establish a employee lost wages fund to provide stipends of two hundred fifty dollars for employees who had lost between twelve and twenty hours of work, and five hundred dollars to employees who had lost more than twenty hours of work. We set aside forty-five thousand dollars. We set a prioritization for how we would allocate that money if we were oversubscribed. We were significantly oversubscribed. Uh, we had requests for $74,000, so $29,000 oversubscribed. Um, we were not, I, I took a kind of a pulse individually of the members of the EDC and none of us were comfortable ratcheting back by 60, by 40% the amount of money that we would give people. We would have had to give the $500 people $330 and the $250 people nothing was how we had set up the, the, the rules, the priorities. And so we uh, vote, We discussed and, and vote, decided to recommend to the select board that we allocate an additional up to $29,000. Now, when we allocated the first 45, we essentially used up our forecasted revenue for 2023. Um, I, we, I've gone back and looked at, I've been saying all along that that doesn't mean we won't have the cash because our grants, we, we have, we don't have, we've used up our, our in, unencumbered funds, but we haven't used up our cash. We have ze essentially zero unencumbered funds, but we have 550 or $600,000 of cash because we haven't given out all of the grants. And we, almost certainly won't. I went back and looked again, so I don't think we will. Uh, if we do, we have, I think, processes that we used in COVID of asking some grantees to hold off and delay and so forth. And we're talking about relatively small amounts of money. So we voted to recommend uh, $29,000 of additional funding to allow us to pay all 157 people who have applied either $500 or $250. Since then, we have received a, not solicited, a private donation of $5,000, which will be transmitted to us through the hub. So that would leave, that would mean that we would only need $24,000. And there have, and we went through a process of asking business owners to confirm the estimates of their employees. And in doing so, they, there were some adjustments in both directions you know, from 250 to 500, from 500 to 250. And the net of that was a slight reduction in the total. So I believe that our 
um, that it, it, what would be useful is if you would approve the up to $29,000 just because the numbers are still, there's still a few more phone calls we have to make, but I'm pretty confident that we will spend closer to 20,000 than 29,000 and we won't spend any money on, other than on this. So I guess we're asking for approval of that additional spending and that will end the lost wages fund. The town is about to start working on processing the checks. They don't need to do, it's less than $600, so it makes it a little bit easier. So. Anyone want to make a motion? I'll move that we approve the <clears throat> extend up to 29,000 in the employee uh, over. I'll second. Submitted. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there's been a huge amount of gratitude directly from the employees about this. You should know that. I see you. Everyone who's worked on this deserves the credit. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Anyone have a follow in road? Yeah. So um, before we get into the uh, discussion about uh, where the board wants to uh, vote on closing file in road during um, foliage season, um, this comes from the Pomford uh, Select Board. Um, and they have a few asks overall that I think we'll talk in a later meeting, but I wanted to just publicly talk about it right now. Um, so their board is leaning in favor of closing cloud lane lanes to all traffic with exceptions for residents, guests, emergency vehicles, and agricultural use. Um, what they would ask from Woodstock is authorization to close the portion of cloud, Woodstock's portion of cloud lane road, um, authorized to put signature and barriers at the intersection of Old River Road, um, their highway crew is available to assist if needed. Um, mail and addresses of Cloud Lane Road residents in Woodstock. So they're a copy of the as approved plan and memo can be mailed to them. Um, and then also an in kind or financial support to patrol the closure of, of the intersection of uh, Old River Road during peak hours. Uh, and I believe they're uh, looking to have the sheriff's office uh, provide that detail uh, for them. Um, so that's kind of the overall request from them. Um, I think tonight we're just talking about whether the board is interested in closing the road or not. Um, and then a further conversation has to happen about um, the other kind of support that they're asking for as well. And you met with? Yep. So um, last week, myself, uh, Chief Green, and Chief Swanson went out and met with uh, some of the Pofford, um board members and, and residents um, at the, where they want to close the road off. Um, Chief Green made one request uh, that he was happy with, um, and they're both confident that they can get emergency vehicles up there without uh, a major issue. Um, as far as long as tourist cars are not parked in front of the gates, which is one of the reasons why the detail is that is being asked, um, so we can make sure that that area is clean. There a motion to. Road. What, what do they take? Have some dates and hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, give me one second and pull it up. I don't know if anyone from property is on the call. They said they may try to come in. You have uh, Ben Brickner and John yes. Peters are here from the Pomfret Select Board. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, what were the dates again? Um, we are looking at um, so I should say this is subject, uh, we're hoping to approve this tomorrow, so there it could change, but we're looking at Saturday, September 23 through Sunday, October 15. Right here. So three weeks. And what I was, what I was, are you looking at for the detail? Uh, the, well, patrol would be during as many daylight hours as is feasible, the closure would be effective around the clock. And I will say the reason why this is in front of the select board is because um, if the board decides not to close the road, um, the Fear that Pomper brought up to our attention would be tourists would go up, drive up through Woodstock, get to the closure and Pomper, then turn around and Woodstock people's driveways and or park there and try to walk 
you know, to, to the sites they want to see. Um, and so it would be a potential safety issue for emergency vehicles to get up there and also a hassle for Woodstock residents as well. Um, and the state law um, basically uh, sums up as the select board may re restrict or close the highway at any time when conditions that are such that travel in public while the highway itself might suffer harm caused by vehicles. In that sense, we could, if we wanted to, uh, look at it as harm to residents if emergency vehicles can't make it up there in time of emergency uh, during this time period. I'm just curious if there's any Woodstock residents on Cloudland Road on the Zoom or in person. Well, Doug Leonard. Um, I work for Mrs. Margarita Pierce. I've worked at the Sleepy Hollow Farm, and I've talked to several people that live on Cloudland Road. If you put a barricade down there, no trespassing, hold under construction, right by the Cushion Cemetery, right? Let the emergency services know the police and the fire and everything else, the emergency service. Now, all they have to do is move that barricade and or anybody that lives there can get a pass or, or something like that, you know, or anybody that goes up to visit gets a pass. But I've been there, I've seen it, and the people here, they're parking everywhere, they're, they're leaving the trash and fields and just making a mess of the whole thing. And I believe Pomfret Slack Board was going to cost the sheriff, it was going to cost the Pomfret people of Cloudland Road $25,000. And I know some of them already donated five thousand dollars towards the cost of the sheriffs for patrol that. But you don't need to spend that money if you put barricades up there, no trespassing, you know, and make sure that the roads are open, barricades open by Cushion Cemetery, so they could get up to and in the top of Barber Hill also. I mean, it's the same. It's, you don't have to have a sheriff standing there for twelve hours a day, you know. Yeah. That'll be more Pomfret, yeah. Pomfret yeah. direction or decision, I think. And yeah. I think we just yeah. yeah, that's Pomfret's. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. right. They're they're pushing. Yeah. Yeah. So I would make a motion that we um, agree to go along with Pomfret and close the Woodstock portion of Cloudland Road for the dates and times they suggest. Do a second. Do a second. No second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Business. New business may we start with the permits. Oh, some space up. The Eastern States Cup happened last year, and I felt there was at least well, I don't live in the village, I don't live anywhere, but it, it seemed that there was minimal impact. Um, from their program because like people were scattered and all coming through at one time. So I would move we grant their um the permit for their event on October first. Okay. They have paid all the I'll second. There hasn't been one. We just need to make sure we have their insurance certificate and yep. We don't. I'll condition the motion on receiving the insurance. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. Right. Uh, the next quick one is um, the next scheduled site board meeting is September 5th, um, originally during the daytime. Uh, I'm asking the board if we can move that meeting to August 29th. Um, and uh, at 6 p.m. and at 5 p.m. having the South Woodstock facility design uh, conversation before that as well. So moved. Second. Second. Mary second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yep, so this is a yearly uh, tradition um, I, from that understood. Um, and basically these are um, People who have not paid the ambulance billing, uh, we reach out to them numerous times. Um, currently, we do not hire a collection agency to go after them further beyond our own outreach. Um, so at this point, it's uh, really a sunk cost for us. Um, so we just need uh, the board to approve the write-off um, 
but off off the books. Are these numbers consistent with the budget? I mean, it won't, will this affect um, in the ambulance budget? It sure, and these are from previous years, okay. so it won't. Do a motion to move that we write off the ambulance bills as designated. Ninety-one thousand six hundred dollars for the yeah. Aye. 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 Up next, we have uh, people from the state who want to talk about a conservation project. Can I just make, because I'm, I may have to leave during this, but um, I just wanted to make a disclosure that um, my house is directly across from Baldy Way, and I have hiked Baldy and the Ellertsons are neighbors, but I don't think that affects my decision in this at all. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Gan Osborne. I'm the Land Conservation Program Manager for the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Uh, and I believe we are joined on the call by Tim Morton, our district stewardship forester who manages our state forest lands in this region, as well as Donna Foster with the Vermont Land Trust. Um, did you receive the materials and map I sent over? Yeah. Great. Um, so uh, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation is working with uh, the Ellertsons uh, to uh, pursue a land exchange of 102 acres. Uh, so we, own and manage uh, Coolidge State Forest in this area, which is, uh, there's one parcel of Coolidge State Forest, what we refer to as the Allen Slayton lot that is separated from the rest of Coolidge State Forest. So it does not have legal access for management and it does not have legal public access either. Um, similarly, the Ellardsons hold a piece of land that is separated from other lands that they own uh, by this tract of Coolidge State Forest. So we've been talking over the years about trying to arrange an exchange where we could both benefit, um, connect our separated parcels, uh, enabling us to both manage the land and enabling public access to the state lands. Um, in addition to the exchange of 102 acres, the Ellingsons have uh, committed to provide a public access easement to the summit of Mount Baldy, um, which would create permanent public access for uh, pedestrian hiking up there. Um, FPR is partnering with the Vermont Land Trust on this uh, project. VLT currently holds a conservation easement on that parcel owned by the Ellertsons. They have committed to approving a subdivision of that parcel to allow for this exchange. And then VLT would also accept a conservation easement from FPR for the 102 acres that we would convey to the Ellertsons so that all uh, all the part or all the acreage involved in this exchange would remain permanently protected. Um, for for FPR, this is really important because it improves public access, it improves management access, and it also um, to access the Allen Slayton lot. We've had to cross private lands in the past, which has been a challenge. So uh, this would eliminate our need to to try to uh, secure right of ways in the future. Um, we went to the Vermont General Assembly earlier this legislative session. Uh, whenever we um, convey an interest in land, we need legislative approval. We received authorization from the General Assembly to move forward. Um, then in order to accept an interest in land, we always seek approval. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, and also we're going for funding to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Uh, we will be before their board in September, and they also ask to see town support for any uh, project that they give funding to. Um, so just wanted to make you aware of this, see if you had any questions, and then also ask for your support of the exchange of uh, 102 acres between the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation and the Ellertsons, um, and the 102 acres that we will receive will be added to Coolidge State Forest. Any questions? Is there any cost of liabilities to the town? No, I think it's a great cost and liabilities. Yeah. No liabilities that I'm aware of. The only implications um, cost wise are regarding the pilot payment. Um, so we make the, the state does not pay tax uh, taxes to the town. We do make a payment in lieu of taxes. Um, I had our uh, 
Lakeach, our state lands administrator who runs our pilot payments, um, calculated this up today just to see what the impact would be to the town's pilot payment and it would decrease the pilot payment by $681.34. And from my understanding um, in talking with uh, Niels Reinhardt is his name, um, that is because the land of Coolidge State Forest uh, is valued at $2,244 an acre, whereas the Ellardson parcel is currently valued at $921 an acre. So there's just a discrepancy in the values of those uh, parcels, even though they're directly adjacent to each other. Um, but we would still continue to, uh, we would make a pilot payment on the 102 acres that we would receive, which is equivalent to the municipal tax rate multiplied by the assessed value for that land. Um, and that's a, because it'd be a subdivision, that's a, that's a ratio of what the uh, parcel is currently valued at. Um, and then we would also, the pilot payment that we're currently making on that existing piece of state land uh, would be decreased by the uh, per acre value of those 102 acres that we would be conveying. So when, if we, when we go through reappraisal, would that change the pilot program if the value of the land increases? Or uh, is it fixed? It is fixed to the year in which we acquire the land. So the pilot payment would stay constant. What could change is if you reassess the value of the land that that the Ellardsons will acquire. Kerry? And Tim and Donna, I believe are on the call. I'm here. I, I'm I'm here. Did Tim or Donna have anything to add that I missed? Um, I would speak. Um, I've literally been working to try to make this happen for 20 years. Um, I'm my third landowner and third ecologist. <laughs> and uh, this is pretty exciting for me. Um, the I think it's as close to a no brainer as you can get in a conservation project. Um, and I, I hope you'll support it. I'm really excited about the possibility of us having a formal, advertised, access, um, easily accessible trail to mount to the summit of Old Baldy from the Curtis Hollow State Forest. That's one of our primary goals. And nothing will change in the neighborhood as far as the neighborhood access through the Ellison parcel, unless the Ellison's changed their mind, but that was the same as it was before. So I think the project has tremendous benefit and I'm very, very, impressed and pleased with how the Vermont Land Trust has worked so well with us to make this happen because it is very complicated. But um, on the ground, it will seem very simple that two entities that had inaccessible land will now have accessible land and the public will not have legal and access to the sum of old Baldy from Curtis Hollow into perpetuity. So I think it's a fantastic project. I hope you'll support it. Maybe Baldy can live back up to its name because I don't think it's very bald right now, is it? It's been growing back in. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we do have a, um, within our easement for the trail um, access, we do have also a clearing easement so we can keep it open. Do you need a motion from us to support this yeah. project? Yeah. Yes. I will move that we support the state and Ellardson's um, land spot. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. And please, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you. I apologize. My husband double committed me, and I cannot pay for the rest of you. Thanks. Stephen, you're up. Hey. Eric, could you uh, allow me to share the screen? <clears throat> I get you there. Yeah, I can give you access. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. We do that. Um, thank you, board, for having me. See you, Susan. Um, for the record, Stephen Bauer, director of planning and zoning, being tonight is the clerk of the planning commission for a pal. 
right? We are talking about a pause to the issuance of new short-term rentals. So we'll get to talking about that. Short-term rentals and bed and breakfast. So good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll start with just the, the general idea of what is the purpose of this pause. Um, there's kind of two major points, and that would be uh, one, we want to ensure when the planning commission takes this full comprehensive view uh, that it, it's, it is fully comprehensive, uh, it's fair and efficient, uh, these current regulations. Uh, we want to contact all the various stakeholders that are that are involved, and we want a true and honest review of something that we haven't looked at since uh, first passing in 2017 and minor amendments in 2019. Um, so the reason for this, this, this pause is, is that we want to limit the creation of, of new short-term rentals and, and bed and breakfast, because part of the review is trying to figure out one, who has the legal right to do it. Um, and two, what's a better way to, to enforce them and really make it a, a, a simpler process. Um, so adding new short-term rentals that would be legal non-conforming uses is just going to add to that confusion while we're doing this review. Um, so you might be asking, what are the goals? What is the Planning Commission looking at these? Uh, it's three questions. Like I just said, uh, what does the community want? Um, we looked at this five years ago. Do we still know exactly what we want? Did we know what we want? What we wanted back then? out of regulating short-term rentals. Um, what do we want going going forward in the future? Uh, I think that's an important question. And something that if you ask anyone in the town, we, we have very, you know, very far to one side, very far to the other. Uh, we want to hear them all and we want to put them together. Um, second, how do we simplify the process? Right now, um, it, is, it is burdensome to say the least. Um, to go through the process. And we'll get a little bit into the more details of that in a second. Uh, and then the third is, how do we make it fair? So going back to that first point is, what does the community want? So like I said, we want to hear from stakeholders, understand what's working. We should, you might as well. Yep, you're right. Um, what does the community want? We're talking about stakeholders and understanding what works and what doesn't. Um, I think that an honest review is going to show that a lot of things about regulating short-term rentals is going well. And I think we're also going to show that a lot of things aren't going perfect and what things should we change. And just simply, that's a, it's been five years since we adopted the current regulations and we, we haven't stopped to ask, hey, how's it going? Um, so it, it's time that we do that. Um, okay, moving on. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, is how do we simplify uh, the process? Like I was saying, it, it, it's burdensome at, at, at the best way to say it. Um, and that's the, the current process requires you go through three different agencies. You go through our office, you go through the fire department for Woodstock, and you go through the uh, state division of fire safety. Uh, each of those has its own application, its own timeline. Um, looking back, since we since we passed this in, in, in 2019, it takes an average of 80 days from the time you walk into our office and apply uh, to the time you are legally allowed to start renting. Seems like a very long time to me. Um, so Planning Commission wants to look at what are ways to simplify that? Uh, can we shorten that timeline? Um, and then I think the third question is how do we make it fair? So the problem with having this incomplete data and kind of inconsistent enforcement is that that leaves a lot of people who are going through the permit process, who are following every rule, who, you know, in the village it's six and the town it's 10, but if you add, you know, if you're in a certain district, it's 15 and one, it's con confusing anyways. Um, but you have people that are getting the permit, following the rules, and then you have people right next door to those people that aren't. Um, so we're trying to say, we're trying to get a hold of 
who has a legal right to do this? Uh, so everyone is on the same fair playing field. Oh yeah, and speaking of legal rights, uh, according to AirDNA that we got from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, uh, AirDNA is, is a, is a they track data for short-term rentals. Um, we actually pulled that number from uh, the Vermont Short-Term Rental Alliance, uh, which we will also include in this planning commission review. Um, we have somewhere between, in the last year, we have somewhere between 66 and 98 active short-term rental listings. Um, neither one of those match what we have in our office or what David has in his office. Um, so that seems like too big of a gap for me. So finally, kind of just to wrap up what we're here and what we're asking for, uh, the department and the planning commission, we, we've set a deadline. Uh, we said uh, six months, which really means it takes a lot of focus. And we say, look, by, by March 31st, we're, we're, we're gonna, we wanna get you this information so that we can come back here and debate it. And we bring all those people along the process uh, and come to a, hopefully an efficient and comprehensive decision. In March 31st, debate it. This, this um, yeah. information will will go to um, the board, and that that yeah. is okay. Yeah. So what I'm proposing is is this this pause uh, goes from October 1st to March 31st, and so what that what that March 31st deadline or the planning commission and the department is to come back before and say, hey, look, we did, we brought in all these people, we looked at all this information and here's some recommendations and if necessary, any proposals to amend the regulations. Is in the pause just to make sure that we don't have new rentals coming in under the old statute? statute? Yes, so the idea is we wanna bring in as, as much of people that are renting under the same Fair code. And what about the people that are already renting? Uh, this moratorium would not affect people currently renting short-term rentals or bed breakfasts. And do you have um, standards that the um, people that have the short-term rentals and bed and breakfasts have you set the confident? The, the name, the person that. So, so what I hear you asking is, yes. is how confident are we of, of the names of the people that yes. we need to reach out to? Yes. Um, I would say not as confident as I would like to be. Um, not as confident as I hope to be at the end of this review. Um, that, that's that's my, my best answer to that question. Well, for the five years, that's, um, it was here you said over five years since the policy has changed. Well, yeah. there was, it was not, there was no change in the policy then. It was started. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't, you know, we didn't inherit in 2029. And so therefore I didn't inherit when I took over a little over a year ago, any sort of a formalized list that says, these are the people that have gone through the process. These are the people who still own the property when they first apply. Um, <laughs> that takes some time, not only to walk through that data, but also think through as a team between the department and the planning commission, not only how do we enforce that, how do we how do we understand who actually has it, um, but then work with the, the community to say, how do we see it going better in the future? This is good. This is good. Yeah. And your confidence will be completed within six months. Yeah, that's the deadline. Uh, I'm gonna. I, mean, I think I'll let Laura speak to that. I, I think yeah. I, I try and continue to push the planning commission um, to when we set our uh, set the focus on something. Um, I I don't want it to be some sort of one year, two year. We kind of yeah. get to it later. Yeah. It's we focus on short term rentals. Um, and we come to a conclusion within that time. And we've been collecting data since <laughs> February. That's when um, Mary Margaret Sloan and I started taking the data portion of this on and trying to see if we could verify records and 
And unfortunately, we found that there's like lots of incomplete data, um, which is which is why Stephen's here in front would, of you. Would also expose the people that are doing this without permits. Yes. Not yet. Not yet. Sorry. Not yet. Yeah. So so part of this process, not only in the review and, and what proposals, is our department, the one of the main between me and David working together. Um, we are we are creating different ways um, to to track this better. Um, not only in in uh, the burden of proof goes on to these non-conforming uses. Uh, so we're going to start starting to utilize that to say this is the list that we have. Um, let's confirm every single person. Some of those in the last couple of years, or at least since I've been on, become a lot easier to say. This is the permit process. Um, we're hoping at the end of that when we say, hey, you might actually benefit if you have a current permit to say, this is the process that you can go to come in compliance. And we're hoping that that actually incentivizes people to say, oh, I want to do that. I want to come into compliance with the current rules. Um, and the other side of that is we kind of give them an opportunity when we get to that point to say, this is the easy path. Please come into compliance. Otherwise, um, we have to use other methods and, and violations and, and involvement that way. Um, so that is the goal of, of this six months to really have a, a better list to move forward with. When there, um, will you have to the fire department and the public service, the three, well, the three, the three agencies? Yes. With the three um, typically go that, you would go to that three person um, now. Yeah. The pod. Yeah. So, so I think are are you are you asking would that be something that would that yes. would continue or yes. is that something? So I don't want to speculate too much on on exactly what those recommendations of the department, the planning commission would be. Uh, I think that's part of why we want to launch this investigation to to come with a a developed recommendation. Um, but I will say it, a goal of having that is to have a, a, a better line of, of easy communication, whether that be an online application or oh. um, some sort of simplified way for me and David to be able to talk without leaving each other voicemails to say, hey, do you have this permit? Hey, is this? So we, are, we don't know today exactly what that looks like. That's right. But that is certainly a goal. I would just say quickly, I was on some of the boards when we were putting these regulations together in 2017. And, you know, candidly, we did it kind of in a panic because Airbnb, you know, Airbnb was just just coming to the village and we wanted to make sure that we, you know, allowed residents to extract value from their properties, but while simultaneously making sure our neighborhoods were preserved and the community feel was preserved. And so it's always been, they've always felt a little slapdash. They've always been impossible to enforce. Um, so I, I think a moratorium is a great idea just to reevaluate um, and make sure we have processes in place that work, you know, for, for residents, for short-term renters, um, for uh, governance. I think it's a good idea. Thank you. The question. There's a question. Why not? Hey guys. Uh, Brett Ralph. I live on Maple Street, resident here. Hi. Hi, Brett. How's it going? Uh, I own one of the largest vacation rental companies in the Upper Valley. We manage over 100 properties, uh, primarily in Quiji. Um, I feel bad for what Stephen had to come into uh, with the cumbersome short-term rental uh, process, I say the least. You know, there's two applications, the third being the, the state. It's impossible to go through. However, I think before this decision is made, there's a lot of other questions that have to be asked. 
what's the impact on employment, right? How many homes are there? And how is this actually, one thing I didn't hear is what's the number of applications that are actually coming in? How cumbersome is it over the next six months? Is it one a month, two a month, three? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and really what's the ultimate purpose on this? What's the impact on real estate? This is a second home market. Uh, I don't know if this is the, the time and venue to get into uh, the actual rules and regulations that happen, but strictly the moratorium, what will that do to people that are buying in this area? The way that the vacation rental market works is a six month time frame turns into 18 months. The way the booking process works, these people purchase homes or people want to bring them online. Those bookings may not actually happen for up to a year uh, in most cases. So by limiting that for six months, we're pushing that out uh, substantially. We're going to be missing uh, uh, prime time next summer uh, for when it comes to uh, availability for rentals, and it's going to drastically reduce the ability to uh, properly rent out these homes. And I, and I totally agree with the fact that we do need a better process. Uh, it's cumbersome, it's difficult, it's lengthy, but do we really need to stop entirely to reevaluate that process? And if we are going to stop, are there additional questions that need to be answered? What's the impact on the town? What's the impact, the economic impact of this? I can speak to the fact that uh, look, if we put a moratorium on this for the next six months and we stop onboarding 10 to 15 new properties, now we own a, a professional management company uh, going by the rules and regulations of the town. What is that? That employment gap is two to $300,000. Those are jobs that we hire, high paying jobs with an average salary of over $40,000, $50,000 a year. What kind of impact does that have on the town? Right. where we won't be able to move forward, people won't be able to expand and, and purchase homes and rent them out. Uh, it's drastically pushing out the time frame here. You are, you are saying that when they're going to do it now, and there's six months that, that's going to do it, they're going to, um, there's the problem, there would not be a problem for the six months. Yeah, so so I, correct me, I, I don't want to yeah. put words in your mouth, but what I think you're saying is, uh, you're asking, is the Planning Commission looking at this yeah. regardless over the next six months? My answer is yes. Uh, we are doing this regardless, whether there's a pause or not. Six um, months. Yep, that yeah, is. so the, the standard procedure that I'm going, that, that we're coming to you with a proposal is just to say, Please help us not add to the confusion while we're while we're doing this. The the uh, the problem and why this is a standard procedure is when you start opening the door and you say, "Look, we we've, we've had this as a public process. We want the community to come in. Please give your feedback." Uh, we're pretty much saying, "Hey, these things might change. Uh, so please come into the zoning office and get your permit." to guarantee that you aren't affected by these or that it's more difficult to enforce um, whatever those changes may be. Um, again, I, I'm not here to speculate on what the Planning Commission is going to recommend or what this board may approve in six months. But part of that, I, I'm hoping that we will actually come back within six months and be able to look at potential hosts and say, look, we this is going to actually help you a lot. Thanks for hanging with us, coming to this community discussion um, and hitting the pause button for six months. Um, yeah, I completely agree that that has to happen. The issue that I have is what's the impact in the next six months? It's not just six months. If there are 10 to 20 new homeowners that are coming in or homeowners that currently live here, vacation homes, which mind you, are not taking anything away from, I, I won't get into that, but they're coming in and they are evaluating the situation based on being able to rent their home. That six month time frame is actually not six months because if they come on board and, and say it was they purchased a home in November, well, we have two months to actually get on board to go through the current process. And then we're losing a huge amount of time in which those, uh, an, an opportunity in which we can actually rent those homes and it's pushing it out substantially. So I fear for the decision being made without fully understanding what's the economic impact by actually shutting these down for six months, not accepting anything new. 
I, I don't, I don't see that there's um, a problem that, that, that the six months is great. There's, there's, um, when we started it, and I, I was not a select board person, but I had a lot of um, input in it, and there was um, was kind of crazy, and I I welcome the six months. Okay. Well, I, what again? What I'll just I'll leave by saying is. As a, a someone who lives in town, owns a local business, I don't think it's appropriate for the town to say it's great, and that's the only reason. I I really behoove the town to please look at the financial impact of this, employment and economic, because there will be an impact. And I think before the decision is made, I strongly suggest we better understand what that is. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. It's the people that um have. The, in, in place, mm -hmm. they will have the people that employ them, and the six months will. Those. And I, I think I think Shelman has made this point. I think other people don't want to talk. I think we need the opportunity to have people who may have a comment as well. Thank you. 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 I mean, I just had a question on where this, but with where this economic impact is coming from. I mean, you know, I mean, I looked on um, Airbnb last night. I looked at all of the houses, and one out of every three was offering a discount, presumably because they can't find customers to to rent their properties. You got ninety listed. You know, I mean, where is the economic impact that is getting lost if you put a pause on this? We already have. A glut of Airbnbs. So it was a question for you. Thank you. That's, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment? Ray, can I respond? Yeah, go ahead. So, so I appreciate uh, Brett's point, and and that is one of the things that I want to look at um, is just essentially what going off of the information that we have the previous year. Um, you know, we don't we don't have we only have a few years to look at, but thinking about if this year was an average year. How many applications are we talking? Um, in that same period last year, um, so what, that would be September 2022 up to um, up to March uh, 23, uh, we had a total of five uh, applications in the town. Um, the year before that, we had two, and the year before that, we had two. Um, so I do want to dispel one thing: the department isn't asking for this because. It, it's burdensome on us. It, it doesn't actually take that much time away from us doing other things. Um, it's it's more so the the idea of, of stopping adding uh, potentially, whether it be a few or what typically happens when you start a process. Now you start to see people come in and we could that's where we could get to. We're adding 10, 15, 20 um, over the next few months. Uh, that are going to be much more difficult to constitutionally reach back over and say, we want you to come back into compliance. That's the reason for the pause. So here I am again doing the thing I hope to hate most on earth, public speaking. Jamin. Jennifer Falvey, Pomfret, Woodstock Realtor. Um, the reason I'm here is uh, short-term rentals have an impact on the real estate values of all of our homes. So when you limit short-term rentals, the value of everyone's home goes down within a town. That's a fact. The, the other fact is that limiting short-term rentals never converts to long-term rentals. That's a fact. I apologize to you guys because you're walking in late. When I came here about 25 years ago, I needed a permit or something. I had a house in town. And I remember Gail Stickney leaning across the table and saying, how can we help you? With a big smile on her face. And I feel like ever since we lost Phil, things have shifted. Uh, as you can imagine, I got a lot of phone calls uh, 
after the trustee meeting. Apparently a lot of people go in and watch it after so that even if there weren't that many people online, they watch it, they go back and they watch it. I got a lot of phone calls and I asked everyone, please come speak. I hate speaking publicly. Let someone else do this. Uh, but they're reticent to because they're afraid of coming under the heat and light if they have a violation. When I was there, I, I, you know, and they're made uncomfortable. Who's doing that or why they feel that? I'm not going to speak to that. But I will say when I mentioned the other day at the trustee meeting that I was Airbnb, I was made to feel uncomfortable as if there was something shameful about it. People don't want to come and talk and tell their story because they don't want to come under the heat and light and antagonize people. And maybe they're like me. They just don't really like public speaking. It's awkward. So I'll share my story because it's typical. When I moved up here, I was getting divorced. I moved three kids to three different states. I bought my husband out of the house. I paid for three colleges. And I did it all while I had cancer. I couldn't work full time. I had no choice but to get that income. What if that happened today and I had to go to you and you said not for six months and we don't know what those rules are going to look like. I would have been in trouble. And those are the stories, the types of stories that I'm hearing. I could not pay so rent. Where are those people? Hmm? Uh, where are they? Yeah. They, they, I can tell you honest, right? They don't want to be here because they, they are afraid. And there's no reason for them to feel that way coming from you guys, but they are afraid if they come and speak up. Is that, do I have that correct? Do you think that's an accurate? It was that, yes. yes. They're afraid. And so when you say, I don't understand what, you know, a six month delay, uh, the impact would be, it's because you're not hearing from these people. You know, if you could do sort of an anonymous survey or something, but the 2019 survey, is not, it, it didn't result in the rules that we, and it, it contradict the rules had nothing to do with that. They didn't jive is what I'm trying to say. The 2019 survey proved that long-term rentals don't come when you limit short-term rentals. It begs the question also, why is every other town around here enjoying the tax benefits of short-term rentals and not limiting them beyond Fire marshals, and I am a big advocate of that. A fire marshal should look at every house, not just like Hartford does. Not at closing, you should get a fire marshal walking through your house. I don't know if we have the bandwidth for that, but every house should be fire safe. Just the other day, I got a call from someone who has a $2 million listing they'd like to put up, and I thought that's a bit steep, that they, they want too much for that house, and they said, yeah, but it could be a and b you know, you could sell it as a BNB, and b put it on as a commercial listing. And I had to say, no, you can't. You're not gonna, the permits go with the owner, not the building. And even if they had a BNB and b permit, we couldn't sell it to anyone as a BNB and b if there's a six month moratorium with an uncertain end beyond that. When I was there, and b it was about a hundred bucks to get a permit, one page and a hand-drawn floor plan. I get, I, I think you guys remember Michael Brands knew, I don't know how he did it, but he, he knew everything. He knew everyone who was Airbnb. He would ride his bike around and check on people and look at houses. I don't know how he did it, but I suspect these rules and these changes, which at the time were extremely controversial and really upsetting. And you guys are just inheriting this problem. Um, I think that they have pushed people underground, that they're too onerous. The new application, just by way of contrasting Gail Stickney leaning across the desk and saying, how can I help you? I don't know who wrote this. This is in the application, I think it's page three. Purpose, the Woodstock Village trustee hereby find that unregulated short-term, i.e. less than 30 day transient occupancy of dwelling units in residential neighborhoods presents a threat to the public welfare relating to compatibility with res residential uses and preservation of the character of the neighborhoods in which they are located and to the availability of housing stock in the village. 
Forget that's about, that's the village. With, with, I'm just saying this is that, the application. The village, we, we have nothing to do with the village. I understand. We're talking about the town. I understand, Ray, but this is the application. It doesn't matter. It says village. It doesn't say the town. It says the village of Woodstock. It doesn't say the town. The tone is what I'm speaking to. But but that's their permit. So. But this is what okay. you get let's, when you let's, go. Let's finish up because we've got more people who want to speak. So. Go ahead. I think over regulating it is the problem. I don't think anything I have heard mandates a moratorium. I think you can do everything that you want to do without a moratorium. It's only two or three applications a month by your own uh, statements. A moratorium is a stigma on real estate values that I don't think you can appreciate unless you're out there selling. Thank you. Thank you. What we're talking about is not relitigating the regulations that are already in place. Is that correct? No. I, I wasn't asking you, I was asking yeah. you. That's your question. Yeah. So so the planning commission is taking a holistic view of short term rentals and bed practice. Um right. So 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 uh, I'm sorry, but what I mean is right now. To the, the motion on the table or or the proposal on the table is to put a moratorium on any new, on any new permits, but we are not at this point talking about new regulations. So this is not the time to relitigate the regulations that have already been passed. That is my view, um, and I think. What you're talking about is a data-driven approach to looking at the existing regulations, the existing processes for both permitting and for enforcement and for follow-up, and then coming up with those data-driven solutions. And at that point, making or perhaps not making proposals to change the existing regulations. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So to reiterate what what Roger is saying is that that forum is the planning commission over the next right. six months. So, so I would suggest that that anybody who feels that they have a stake in this, either either as a citizen or as somebody who who represents an industry, is going to have an opportunity to weigh in at that time. What you're asking for now, if I understand correctly, is let's not be putting new permits out there while we're talking about potentially changing the regulations. And I absolutely support that. I think it's a very good idea. Um, on a side note, I, I would say that clearly with the number of permits that you've gone through and the number of Airbnbs that you can find in a cursory search any day, there's a huge compliance and enforcement issue. Um, and that's, I presume something that you're going to be looking at. Um, and I understand, I don't think anybody's talking about not permitting Airbnbs. Um, I don't think that was ever part of the original legislation or the, uh, the regulations. I never know, is this legislation or what? <laughs> um, so, and you know, there are other methodologies out there and you were talking about the permitting problems and how long it can take, which is obviously burdensome on you and burdensome on the permittees. There are solutions, software solutions out there, which I'm sure you know. I mean, I did a cursory 10 minute search this morning and I found like 40 companies that will do a kind of soup to nuts of this. They'll do the permitting, they'll do the, the and they'll look for those who are not, who are who are victimizing the permittees by not getting permits. So so I I urge I urge you to to address this not as a relitigation of existing existing regulations, but an understanding that you're taking a long, hard look at those regulations. And now is a good time to hit the pause button. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Wendy online has her hand up for a little while. Hey, Wendy. Wendy, you want to mute yourself? Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Mary and Ray and Carrie, uh, Carrie for yeah. listening. Um, 
I applaud the planning commission and Steve and the planning and zoning department for taking this on as a five-year review. Uh, I participated in the 2019 establishment of uh, protocols and uh, uh, guidelines uh, where much of these top, these two, you know, these areas were debated. And I do think that <clears throat> moving forward then with short-term rental uh, uh, ordinance and policy was an important step that uh, I still applaud. I, I'm in favor of the moratorium so that the people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and look at this again, five years is a reasonable and I think legit, you know, uh, documented amount of time to review is, is completely appropriate. And uh, I think that the team needs to be able to focus and not have distraction. Uh, I will say that listening to all the stakeholders is still going to happen. So a moratorium doesn't mean they're not going to listen to vantage points. It just means they can focus, in my opinion. And again, I, I hope the select board will decide to support their request. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Yep. Um, um, I was at the village trustee meeting and uh, uh, they decided that they they couldn't agree on the vote. Nobody wanted to vote on it. Um, Ray, when you say we are, you're hearing about the permanence of the village and it's like, oh, well, we have a select board. But we're all the same community. So either you shouldn't be voting on anything because it's the village and they decide or it has to be we're something. Not the village will vote on the areas outside the village. Not in the so village. it wouldn't affect anything in the village if you vote for it. It's only for the people. Right. That's correct. I see. Right. And how many applications do you get? Why do you need six months? Why don't you say you need two months? Because six months is the standard that time. But you don't need the standard time. You don't have that many things to process. But they, if they finish, so it, it's not a it's not a process. It's not a question of process. It's a question of putting a review in on, in place and talking to stakeholders and having conversations and getting data and then putting together a new policy that is going to take a long period of time. It's not about filing applications. No, I know that. Okay. So the planning commission is made up of volunteers who have other responsibilities as well. The plan zone office is an office of two that has a lot of responsibilities. They can't dedicate 40 hours a week every week for two months to get this done. That's why it's six months to give enough time to get it all completed. Is planning commission is part of the select board? Uh, no. I mean, who, no. We're appointed by the trustees and the- By the trustees. No, and the select board. Well, that's, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It's you're a doing appointed. We're appointed. <clears throat> one does wonder if it were all one community calling itself a township where we might be eligible for a lot more money than both groups get, if the whole process would be smoother. That's a conversation for another day. <laughs> I know. That'll take a little bit more than yeah. six months. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to investigate. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. Why not? Okay, let's go. Even, Laura, Lord. I don't want to be a thorn in your side. Sorry, can you see? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Derek DeMoss, I own uh, short-term and long-term rental properties in the Woodstock Village and Tower. Um, I don't want to be a thorn on your side, in your side on this. Um, my one concern about the moratorium is that you potentially are going to have people knocking on your door saying, I want a permit. I want to follow the rules. I want to do what needs to be done to get this done. And now you're shutting the door in their face. And now over the next six months, they become one of the people that now don't follow. They're going to go, they're going to get their Airbnb um, listing. They're going to get it up and running. They're going to start taking bookings. They're going to start receiving bookings. That, that's really my one concern right now is that the people who want to follow the rules, they're coming to your door and they're saying, this is what I want to do. How do I do it correctly? 
and by creating the six months, you can't do any of it. Does that start pushing people away and go on the route of going underground and not following? That's just the only thing I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susie, come on up. Um, Susie Spells with Stock Village. So I get really confused. He says that once you get the application, it's another year before you can start taking bookings. He's saying now it's, you you know, um, they can get bookings within six months. I mean, I don't think we're getting accurate information here. We're getting very contradictory information. If somebody comes in on, on month two of the moratorium, how can they possibly start doing um, bookings on Airbnb if he's right, it takes a full year? So I just don't understand. I don't understand the information. I hear contradictory information. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't think. Hey, Philip and Jerry, I'm with uh, Michi Lakes Reynolds with Brett here, and I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I understand the confusion there. I guess the whole process of short-term rentals is when people come into this area and stay, and they find out they love it, they want a second home, and that's what we found in, in Woodstock, really, in the market in Woodstock. It's a lot different than Michi. So they come out and they purchase that home. It might be six months before we even go for this this car sometimes like we're working with families now because we know the criteria that they have to go through we start working with them before we even think about going for the short-term rental thing so we've got people that are already to that point where okay now it's time we're ready to go to fill out the forms for short-term rental and they may have invested fifty thousand dollars at that point in their house to get it ready for that we're saying okay now you got to wait another six months to do that and then after the fact is when once that's all passed and done, now we have to start putting them in the system. So it's another three to four months before they can start running. And the economic impact is not just the revenue that these these homes are getting. It's the cleaners around here that are cleaning these homes. I think you said there's around 90 in Woodstock right now in that bid that you've seen. So you're thinking about those people moving in and out weekly. They have cleaners, local cleaners that would live here going in and cleaning these homes. Um, uh, just the stuff they've been using to operate these short-term rentals is is generating revenue for, from taxpayers in, in Woodstock and people spending a lot of money in Woodstock while they're staying here and looking to buy a house because they loved it so much. So those are the we have a different market in Woodstock and Queechee than you'll find in Ski Hills. It's families coming up here and enjoying the beauty, and that's what we've seen. Thank you. Very good question. I just have one more question based on what you just said. Because, um, you know, when um, you know, so you get a house, and you you know you can raise the value by saying, okay, it's a Airbnb, you know, but there are lots of families that to you know got a lot more kindergartners and a lot of pandemic babies around. If you go to the outdoor concert, you'll see. So they go out and they spend money too every single day. Right. I mean, they hire cleaners, they pay for childcare, they pay for groceries every day, they buy kids clothes, they do all this, they spend money. Um, have you done an economic impact to say that an Airbnb person pays more than, you know, a family moving into to a house? Is there an economic impact? Because I would like to know that. I, mean, I, I think we're just yeah, getting we, a little off track yeah, on what we're here to talk about. I think we want to focus on uh, whether the moratorium should be taken up by the select board in the town or not, uh, and not more uh, other details about Airbnbs in general. So, so I will entertain a motion to. So moved. Uh, opposed. No, I'm sorry, no, no motion has moved yet. Yeah. With, oh, I had to make a motion to put a temporary pause on. Zoning permits for short term rentals and bed and breakfast. So moved. Oh, oh can I say specifically from, we'll, we'll actually move it from uh, instead of September 1st, uh, from okay. October 1st to the end of March. So October 1st, 2023 to March 31st, 2024. And the reason why is to realizing that in this process we've been getting so many calls about people curious about short-term rentals now um that 
we realized that because it, under the current regulations, it has to go through conditional use approval. Uh, so that gives people essentially until August 29th to get their application to us to go through that process. Uh, okay, so, so so the motion is to temporary pause of zoning permits for short-term rentals, bed and breakfast from October 1st, 2023 to March 23rd, 2024. 31st. 31st, 2024. Is there a motion? Yes. So moved. Second? Yes. Second by Mary. All those in favor, say aye. 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 I tell it. Okay. Thank, nice. thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other business, just um, so uh, yeah, hold on. So we're following the and I'm happy to see copies for you. Did you all see the uh article that was in the Valley News about towns that are shared, you need to share. Uh, employees. Okay, so I think that's a completely different conversation that we don't have the agenda right now. So it's best if we don't talk about something. Okay. And that's something we put on our future agenda if you want to come speak about it. Yeah. There's no such thing as a citizen comment. It was that happened earlier in the meeting. It had to be earlier. Ah. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, the select board has to interview. Um, the select board uh, candidates for the open position. Um, I believe we talked about doing it on August 22nd at 7 p.m. Um, yeah. Um, so that works. That's okay. okay. Um, and I'll put together some questions and send it to the board members, and we can kind of uh, go over what questions we want to ask and process from there. Good. Okay. Last, we have approval of minutes <clears throat> from. I would move to approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to adjourn? Yes. Mary, Kevin, do you want to second it? Harry. Harry. Harry, second. Harry, you want to mute? Sorry. Uh, do you want to um, second the motion to adjourn? Yes. Oh, yes, I will second that motion. Thank you. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.